I'm here with Lisa Hardaway, vocalist for the band Darstar previously, and with a new project we're going to talk about right after that. How are you doing tonight? I'm great, Mark. How are you? Doing fabulous. Uh, we're going to start off, and we're just going to go like way, way back. We're going to go back to the beginning, and uh, <laughs> let's talk about like the first artist that you like remember like falling in love with, not like romantically, but like musically. <laughs> Well, um, I guess it depends on how far back you are talking. When I was four, I was really into Wham, and I still have 45 that I used to play on my little record player all the time. So technically, Wham, especially Waking Up Before You Go-Go, was my absolute favorite song. It's still one of my favorites. Um, but then I guess... Uh, one of the bands that I paid the most attention to as a like, juvenile and young adult is probably the Smashing Pumpkins, who I discovered when I was probably about 12. So what was that, like 1991 or two? And um, kind of got really hung up on them for many, many years and went to concerts every time they came to town and met them once and all that, that stuff. So, But... Uh, I know Billy Corgan's gone a little ape shit in my opinion, so I haven't kept up with them in years, but I would probably have to say that that would be my default answer is the Smashing Pumpkins. As I'm sure that's probably applicable to a lot of kids who are 90s, 90s raised, you know. So. Yeah, I, I don't feel bad. I, I had the, uh, the Wham! Uh, 45 as well. Yeah, I'm surprised mine still plays. It doesn't play well, but it plays. I did see uh, Smashing Pumpkins on uh, recently, like maybe like a couple years ago with their new lineup. And uh, they, they're mostly still just, even though they have new material, they're playing like their old stuff like most of the time. Yeah, I don't really know how I feel about that. I mean, I'm I'm a purist as far as that band goes. So after... They initially broke up, and Jimmy Chamberlain had his problems, and Darcy, who still apparently has problems, you know, I just kind of, eh, it's not the same without everybody. What was the first concert you ever attended that you can remember? That I can remember? It was probably the Smashing Pumpkins Melancholy tour um, back in, like, 1996. I'm pretty sure I probably went to, you know, some small house shows and stuff earlier on in high school, but uh, that'd probably be my first actual legit uh, concert that I'd ever been to. You know, my first, like, real arena rock kind of show. Those are always really fun. I haven't been to one of those in years, though. So when did you first, like, realize that music was something that you could do and that you actually wanted to pursue that? Well, <clears throat> I still don't think I can do it. <laughs> I'm not very good, technically. Um, but I was always really interested in music, and, uh, you know, when I was in junior high, I wanted a guitar, so my parents got an acoustic for me for uh, Christmas one year. And I taught myself how to play it just with some chord charts and, you know, basic stuff like that, and uh, um, I didn't really actually get around to playing, playing, you know, shows and stuff until I was out of college, so back in about 2007 was probably the first time I played an actual live show, even though I'd been fiddling, you know, with guitars and keyboards and stuff since I was, you know... The eight, eight of six is probably when I first got interested in music, but had to self-teach my, you know, self, I was self-taught, so, um, yeah, I never really had the opportunity to actually play, it never even really crossed my mind until I was a lot older, so, and then people, there was such a good response that I was like, well, shit, I, I, I didn't know that I can actually sort of play and write songs that people like, so it was just like a hobby that I had, I'd sit in my office and just, you know, dick around with stuff and people seem to like it so and they still do talk a little bit about how like Darstar was formed like from the from the days when you like met the band members and how it all came together okay well um the drummer Josh uh, and the main guitarist 
then I knew from college. Um, and Ben was actually my boyfriend for a few years in college. And then, um, you know, as we got older and people moved away and stuff like that, we kind of weren't in immediate contact, but we're, we, I was still friends with everybody. And uh, I was in this uh, previous little duo called Gun Gun with um, my friend Ashley, who is actually in a group now called Deaf Rain, which um, I recommend checking out. She's really good. Anyway, so she and I were in this little project, and um, she she just didn't have time for it anymore because she was working on some other stuff, and I was about to get rid of our um, give up the lease on our practice space when Josh calls me out of the blue and he says, um, hey, Ben and I were wondering if you wanted to start a project. Uh, and so I said, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I don't have to give up this practice space just yet, so if we want to get together and, and try things out and see what happens, then um, then cool. And so that's what we did. And Josh and Ben had a previous uh, band that they were in, like a punk band for a bit, but um that did what all bands do and just kind of died out after a while and so they were looking for another project um so yeah we started practicing it was just the three of us at first and um the funny thing is is almost all of the songs on the dark star album are old gun gun songs from my <laughs> previous project with my friend ashley because uh, we never really did anything with them we just played a few shows and they were kind of like all my artistic property, my intellectual property, so I just reused them and taught them to the guys, and that's how we ended up with pretty much all of the material <clears throat> on Tiny Darkness, so uh, then Josh and Ben added Carson, who played um, like backup guitar, and he did like the effects and stuff, and then um, their friend Tony, who was on bass. Previous to that, we had another guy named Mike who was doing all the electronic stuff, but um, he's in advertising, and they have really weird schedules, so he just wasn't able to keep up with the pace of, you know, working and being in the band, too, that played shows, so he quit. Um, but, yeah, and so that's that's kind of what the genesis of Darstar was, is just Josh happened to call at the right time, and I happened to have a backlog of material, so <clears throat> it just kind of worked out. Now, how did that deal with uh, Idol Records come about? Because, I mean, you guys, the, your first debut, your first and only uh, album that you guys put out was uh, on that record label. Well, it's hard to say, really, because um, I know that Josh Arbs is an airplane salesman, and so by nature he's very salesman-like. Um, so he could sell anybody the, their own shirt that they're wearing kind of thing. Um, and I know that he had contacted Idol, um, and the deal with Idol is that within your contract, you've got to come out with, you know, one record every so many years or whatever. Anyway, we already had one basically put together, so it was kind of like an easy scoop up for Idol, I think, the fact that there's a band that already has essentially an album together so there's like uh, the expectations are already met um, and so I think just the fact that Josh was able to present that to them as far as like basically a done package I think that kind of helped us get um, uh, picked up pretty easily but also like we were responsible for a lot of our own marketing and um, we were pretty heavy as far as uh you know, putting our own names out there. So at the time, we were already sort of, you know, our name was popping up in all the, you know, local music newspapers and on all the blogs, So you know, even the ones that hated us and all that stuff. And we knew a lot of people that were also in the Dallas, Fort Worth area kind of scene. So, um, you know, I think that kind of helped as well, that our name was already sort of out there. But the funny thing about Idol Records, and this isn't true for all bands, but it's been commented before that every band that joins Idol Records breaks up shortly after. <laughs> like, that's kind of what happens. So I still get my $4 royalty checks every quarter, which are pretty hilarious, but I still cash them. <laughs> <laughs> so, $4 royalty checks, yes. Yeah, I know that some of our songs have been used for like commercials on um, the internet, but... 
um, the, the the clips of our songs j- get just so like chopped and screwed. You can't even identify it as a Dark Star song anymore. <laughs> You know, it just ends up being like background music for an RC car commercial to only seen online. <laughs> mm. so, well, to be fair, that yeah. is more than you get through Spotify. Yeah, and I don't even know if we are on Spotify, and if anybody's getting any money from that, it's not me, and I, you know, whatever, I will live without the 50 cents, I guess, so. Yeah, it is on Spotify. Is it? Okay, well, yeah. I'm sure Josh is getting all of that cash. It, well, so it's... <laughs> I think it. I think it's point zero. T- it's it's fractions of a cent per play. So I mean. Oh, then he's probably not getting anything. I'm sure nobody's listening to that shit on there right now. Um, I don't even have any copies of my record. <laughs> you don't have a copy of your own record. No, and we had so many copies of it in um, in our practice space. But then after the band broke up, I never saw an, a, a CD or a T-shirt. Or I think I have like a couple of koozies. I can probably send you one. I think I have a couple. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can listen on Spotify. The, uh, what's that? You can listen on Spotify. It's on there. Oh, it's on Spotify. Yeah, we're on Pandora too. I have I have the Dark Star Station on my Pandora for sure. <laughs> Now, was and there I a have second, the here. Huh? Was there a second release planned? Were you starting to work on a second release? Of Darstar or for something else? For Darstar. Um, well, we did start writing new songs. Um, but, I mean, it, I think we probably played a couple of the new songs, like, at a show or two. Um, but we honestly never got around to even, like, talking about putting out a second album. So, things fell apart pretty quick. So, before I knew it, like, there was no Dark Star. So, you guys had, like, it was kind of like a retro feel to you. I mean, it kind of reminded me a little bit of bands that were, like, maybe around, like, 15 to 20 years before, like, you actually came out with a CD. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And the reason for that is because all of us uh, grew up in Dallas um, in the 90s. So um, we're really influenced by a lot of the 90s local music here, which, you know, is is representative basically of, like, what you would have heard around that time anyway. Um, So, I mean, I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, we're all 90s kids, so, you know, we can't help but... Uh, kind of emulate our, our predecessors. I have to ask you about uh, the names for some of these songs because the names mm-hmm. for some of the songs on here are pretty creative. How did how did yeah, you come up yeah. with the names? Like on any of them? Yeah, just like the overall naming of process because like all of them are like pretty creative. All right. Well, I think one of my coworkers actually asked me recently about um, underestimated door jam. Like, what's what's that all about? And basically, it's it's pretty straightforward answer. Which is, um, the night that I wrote that song, I was like back like two thousand seven or eight. I was walking from one room in my house to the other and turned to the corner too fast and ran into the door jam. And I'm, you know, I, and I do that a lot. I'm really bad about underestimating the space that I have in a doorway. I guess it's because I, I, I'm a small person, so I feel like I always have enough room wherever I go, but I never do. And I have a really bad tendency of running, like, underestimating the door jams on doorways. And so that's kind of where that came from. And then uh, Val Kilmer's Tennis Elbow, that's all been, like, he had this weird fascination with apparently Val Kilmer's Tennis Elbow. So whenever we wrote that song, he decided that that should be the title, which was Time with Me. <laughs> Are there any other ones that you specifically want to Those know were about? the two that I was going to ask you about the most. Oh, really? That's funny. How often did you guys play live? Oh, man. There was a point when we were playing sometimes three times a week. Uh, and that was like leading up to the release of the album and then after that so for maybe a good solid two years we were playing at the very least one show a week it started getting ridiculous because all of us had full full time so having that kind of schedule is sort of crazy even if you're just doing shows on the weekends you still never have time to recover from your day job 
and then even less time to recover from like having to drive places for shows or you know being up really late because you know you've got to deal with the payout and paying the other bands or whatever the hell you know like PR hanging out and making sure you no one notices that you left after your set kind of thing because you don't feel good or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, we only ever, we played just locally around Dallas, and we played, um, we went down to Austin once for a show at this complete total shithole called Trophies, which I think they condemned. And then, um, yeah, Dallas, Dallas was a, I mean, we sold out our CD release show. I don't remember what the, like, you know, maximum capacity was as a venue, but that's probably the best show we ever played. But, yeah, we, we played pretty regularly. I think that was kind of like a point of like stress with everybody because, you know, like I have a kid, some people were married or going to have kids and stuff like that. So it just got to be like a little overwhelming. I don't recommend musicianship for people with like normal day jobs and lives and stuff. <laughs> it's too, it's, it's hard. Now you, you talked a little bit about it, but um, how did the band like ultimately end? Um, well, there were problems, um, okay, the, the, being in, in a band is just like being in a relationship. The difference is that when, you know, Darstar broke up, it was like breaking up with four boyfriends instead of just one, which sucks <laughs> really bad. Um, I think everybody was being kind of burnt out. Um, there was just a lot of tension, uh, between people in the band, I would get complaints from other members about other members in the band, uh, and it just kind of turned into, like, it just quit being fun, and it was pretty obvious that, that a couple people just didn't want to do it anymore, but didn't want to let everybody down, and there were some really poor decisions being made on behalf of the band by people who shouldn't have been making these decisions on their own without, you know, everybody's um, say-so, which eventually led to a lot of disappointment and a lot of really crappy shows, and um, just just everybody was getting just really generally pissed off. So um, the drummer, Josh, he ended up quitting uh, because his wife was pregnant, and, you know, he had a lot of responsibility to his family and stuff like that. So he quit, and then it never really came up again as far as uh, replacing him or, you know, having him just take a leave or whatever, and then, you know, the band continue later, um, which always sort of pissed me off because, you know drummers are replaceable and uh, I mean most band members are replaceable so if you have a good thing going and one person quits generally speaking you would just try to find a suitable replacement you know in the interim but nobody really wanted to do that so I just kind of got you know left hanging I guess but it didn't really matter because one of the, our bases had some other bands that are one of our guitarists ended up joining, and then the, Ben ended up joining this band who was also on Idol, uh, and then Josh. I haven't, I haven't honestly I haven't talked to any of them in years because it uh, it was one of those uh, situations where the band breaks up and then like n- nobody really speaks to each other again, kind of deal. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I talk to Carson occasionally, um, the guy who the, he does keyboards and the effects and stuff. Um, but yeah, I honestly haven't really heard from any of those guys in a long time. No, yeah. there's a lot more to the story than that, but I don't really think anybody has that kind of time. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the nutshell. It's basically what ha- what always happens on D- H1 behind the music, a local scale. Well, that that kind of uh, negates my next question. I was going to ask if there was ever any talks of the band getting back together, but we can just cross that off as being no. Yeah, and even if they... I don't know, I guess even if any of those guys came to me about it, 
I don't really have time, man. Like, I just do not have time to commit to a full, you know, a full-time project like that anyway. Plus, I would just say hell no. <laughs> so, yeah. But well, you I do am have something. On. You do have something you're kind of working on I now. I mean, you have the, the Kimberlite project. I have that. Um, I played a show here back in September for, and there are these really awesome guys who have a podcast called Men Seeking Tomahawks, and they put together a show of all the um, musical people whose music they've had on their show. So they asked me to do that, but it was really tough because I didn't actually have a band. Um, I had recordings because I had recorded at my uh, friend's studio, um, but had no band. Uh, luckily, uh, my friend that recorded me uh, agreed to kind of put together a little ensemble for me, so I was able to play that show. But I haven't played a show since, and um, haven't really spent a whole lot of time writing anything. Um, it's really just like a time poverty issue. Like I have an eight and a half year old, and I work like forty. 50 hours a week, so I don't really have a whole lot of time, but um, I do have a, another project that I'm working on with a friend of mine. Um, uh, we get together, like, every other Sunday because he's, you know, in school and married and has a kid, and, you know, he's short on time, but we get together and we work on um, kind of, like, electronic-driven stuff, but not, not like, your um, EDM-type stuff, but, like, uh more like the kind of weird electronic stuff Warner Brothers probably used in cartoons back in the day. Um, so we're slowly cobbling together some stuff. I think we have like five songs. We just haven't uh, figured out what outlet we want to release them on yet. Plus, I don't think we've agreed on a project name yet either. So, um, but yeah, I am working on stuff. It's just a really, really slow process because I just do not have time. I actually uh, can't figure out how I found time to do Dark Star. To be uh, completely honest, I don't know how I did that at all. But it happened somehow. Now, is Kimberlite something? I mean, I've looked everywhere, and you have, like, there's no Facebook page for it. There's no, like, promotion for it. It just, like, kind of, like, there's the songs, and there you go. Yeah. Um, I really hate social media. And um, so I really didn't feel like having to manage another Facebook page. And um, I don't know. I'm kind of old school. I figure if people really want to find music, then they can look for it. I just kind of leave it up to people. If they ask me about it, I'll tell them about it. And if they really feel like going and looking, then they can. I think I've only posted the link to the SoundCloud uh, or wait, is it Bandcamp? See, yeah, I don't band even know camp. what it's called. I think it's Bandcamp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Band camp. <laughs> Like, I think I've posted it, like, once. Um, so, yeah. I, uh, I don't really like the technological aspect of having to promote yourself. You know, like, what did we do before that? You know, how did you find out about shows and, and, and stuff like that you, you know like usually word of mouth or like weird flyers you pick up at the record store but those don't exist anymore really either so you know it's easier it's, it's better to make it harder for people to find stuff because maybe when they do they'll appreciate it more with your music stuff now is there is there basically there's no plans to try and get this like on a bigger scale or anything this has basically just become like maybe like a hobby for you now yeah, I would say that that's true. Um, I, I don't want to say that I'm not interested in it, but I would kind of be lying, I think, if I said I wasn't. I mean, I still love music, and uh, I still enjoy playing uh, various instruments, and I love watching other people play and going to shows and stuff like that. But I think I just got so... My heart was just so broken with Dar Stars that it kind of just was like, eh, I just really don't want to deal with all of that again, um, just because of the way all that went down. Um, but I really just want to be a talk show host. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I really do. I'm going to start this blog. Uh, I could do like a video blog. Uh, I'm really, really into horror films. 
Uh, and I really like bad ones, like the like the, the D movie, the Z movie, even if you will, you know, just like horrible horror movies. And I always happen to come across some gems, right? So I want to do a video blog where I discuss various and myriad horror-themed uh, things, and anything from like books to movies to whatever's going on at the different conventions and stuff like that. So. I don't know. I guess my interests have kind of changed. Plus, I just don't have any time. <laughs> yeah. I really don't. Yeah, I, mean, I love like horror movies. That's my favorite genre. Yeah, I mean, they're so good. And I think there's, uh, there, I don't, there don't seem to be very many females who appreciate the genre. It seems more of like a guy centric sort of thing, which I get that. Um, so I think it'd be interesting to have kind of like a chick's perspective or opinion on, uh, on the the genre in general, so I mean, I I read Fangoria magazine. I buy it every every issue. I've got stacks and stacks of them dating back to like 1994. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's, I've always been into it. Um, so I don't know. I just think it's time for me to find something else to be creative with. Well, I'm not really sure how to end the interview because. Usually I'll tell people to go hit up your Facebook page or tell them where to find you, but this is like, this is the most de depressing interview ever. Because <laughs> it's like... <laughs> I'm sorry. You can't, no, it's not your fault. It's, that's the music industry. That's that's the way most interviews are going to end. And you can't find her anywhere because she hates the music industry now, so... <laughs> yeah, I kind of, I, that's probably a pretty fair way to put it. I don't hate it, I just don't... What did I say at work that would be pertinent? I said something about my job, because I hate that, too. And, um, yeah, I said something about just, like, not being cut out for it. I'm just not. So. I could probably be a pretty good jingle writer, though, but I never tried that, because it reminds me too much of, like, uh, those two weird uncles on Full House. <laughs>